All right, good afternoon, everyone. As uh, people are starting to file into the virtual session, I would like to first introduce myself. My name is Luke Fassen. I'm a strategic analyst at the Hague Center for Strategic Studies. And welcome to our panel discussion to launch our red lines and baselines reports on a European multi-stakeholder approach to counter disinformation. Now, today we have an amazing panel of experts from government, EU institutions, industry, and civil society to talk about some of the rules of the road and fight against disinformation. So let me first introduce our speakers. First off, we have Natalie Yaksma. She is the ambassador for cyber and security policy at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Netherlands. Previously, she was a Dutch ambassador in Cyprus and the head of security policy, security and defense policy at the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Next up, we have Bart Hultijs, member of the European Parliament, part of the Reno Europe fraction. And before that, he was head of cybersecurity at the Dutch Ministry of Defense. He really is one of the leading MEPs dealing with foreign interference, disinformation, and cyber, and is also one of the rapporteurs of the uh, update of the NIS directive. Uh, from the private sector, we have Liga Rosenthal, Senior Director of European Government Affairs at Microsoft. She is a former Latvian cyber diplomat at the EU and NATO. And in 2019, she was named by SC Magazine as one of the 50 top women in cybersecurity for Europe. Then we have Tr Dr. Trisha Meyer. She is assistant professor in digital governance and participate at the participation at the United Universiteit Brussels. Uh, she mainly focuses on disinformation and the regulatory models for content moderation for tech platforms. She's also one of the principal investigators of the European Digital Media Observatory for Belgium and Luxembourg. And then finally, we have Dr. Alexander Klimberg, my boss, co-author of the report. Uh, <laughs> he is the HSS Cyber Program Director and Director of the Global Commission on the Stability of Cyberspace. Now, he has numerous other think tank affiliations, including at the Austrian think tank for Europe and Security Policy and at CSIS. Uh, his book, The Darkening Web, published by Penguin, was described by the New York Review of Books as a prescient and most important book and deals with some of the issues that we will be dealing with today on information warfare and cyber warfare. Now, Alexander, with that, I want to give the word to you for a short word of welcome for everyone here. Well, thank you very much, Luke, and thank you all for joining today. So disinformation is a real and growing challenge for liberal democracies. We have seen how it exasperates existing political polarizations, undermines trust in our institutions, or even invites mass violence against them. UN Secretary General Guterres even warned of a dangerous epidemic of misinformation when referring to COVID-19 and the vaccines that can even harm our public health. Now, in our report, we concentrate on disinformation rather than misinformation, as drawing on the European Democracy Action Plan of definition, disinformation is information that is false and deliberately created to harm a person, social group, organization, or country. And therefore, sometimes considered a new form of state propaganda, although I'd like to point out that also domestic forces can also be very adept in developing and deploying disinformation campaigns. Now, the report being launched today is the second in a series that the Hague Center for Strategic Studies has undertaken as part of a research framework established by the Dutch Ministries of Foreign Affairs and Defense. Um, we would like to take this opportunity to thank them for their generous support. In our previous report from the series, Blurred Lines to Red Lines, we suggested that international norms against disinformation were possible, especially, especially if they were linked to uh, norms on against covert election interference and the non-intervention principle in international law. But we also said this approach was fraught with risks, that the risk of furthering state control over a non-state internet, but also the risk towards freedom of speech and expression overall, and finally the risk that these diplomatic measures would simply not be enough. We therefore suggested in that last report that a wider approach beyond international security was needed, one that took into account not only our traditions of freedom of expression, the multi-stakeholder reality of managing a digital ecosystem, but also private sector leadership and the limitations of it in, the, in this domain. In our new report, Red Lines and Baselines, spearheaded by my colleague, Luke Faison, we explore what rules of the road can be developed to counter disinformation and how we can advance them. So we explored two routes. One is the government to government uh, uh, norms route, or what we call the, the big N or capital N norms route, similar to those that were negotiated in the UN First Committee Group of Governmental Experts process. And the second is an expansion of the burgeoning European 
co-regulation approach and managing counter disinformation efforts. Now we are particularly in favor of a second route and this has two main features to it. Firstly, a proposed industry charter that we suggest the European Commission take the lead on in negotiating and prompting with all relevant actors. We suggest eight standards for action in this charter. That would be community guidelines, bot takedowns, fact checking, labeling, political advertising, verified information features, rules and algorithms and content moderation, and community moderation and remediation guidelines. The details, of course, are all in the report, and I would encourage you to look this up. Secondly, we suggest a very concrete multi-stakeholder operational component of this new co-European co-regulation approach, namely a disinformation, information sharing and analysis center or disinfo ISAC, which would build on the lessons learned from similar efforts in the past dealing with extremist content. We will discuss this more in depth later. Together, this report features 10 recommendations that we hope will be able to advance discussion on countering disinformation in Europe. These proposals come at a time when the platforms are updating their EU code of practice against misinformation rules, and the EU increases its presence in this space through the Digital Service Act and the Digital Market Act. As the European approach to social media activities shifts from self-regulation towards co-regulation, many new options are possible. We therefore look, for, look forward to discussing these options with you today. Thank you. All right, thanks, Alexander, for the... Uh introductory remarks. Um, now, before we turn to the panel discussion, we are very honored to kick off today's discussion with a video message from Vera Jourova, who is the European Commission's Vice President for Values and Transparency. Now, our disinformation efforts uh, through the European Democracy Action Plan and the Code of Practice. Unfortunately, she was not able to join us in person, but we are very thankful that the Vice President sent us a video message with an update on the EU's efforts and also some reflections on the report. So with that, we'll now play a video message. Thanks. Since 2017, the Commission has worked to boost the capacity of our societies to understand, detect and counter threats linked to disinformation, information manipulation and interference online. There is no simple answer to this threat. We need an all-of-society approach with responsibilities and roles for all actors. We have adopted several initiatives that guide our ambitions, starting with the Action Plan Against Disinformation in 2018. Now we are implementing the European Democracy Action Plan adopted at the end of 2020. Legislative proposals have been made, others will follow soon, and specific initiatives to strengthen the transparency and accountability of platforms are underway. While platforms improve rapid access to information, they facilitate with the same or even higher speed a flood of disinformation. We have seen this during the pandemic. We are seeing it in the coordinated campaigns that undermine trust in our institutions. And national elections are a particularly fertile ground. Reports show how the German federal election spurred new COVID-related disinformation or gave long-lasting myths a second life with a new twist, such as the Great Reset Theory, for instance. Recent examples, like the pro-Kremlin RT media case, also show that media outlets or editorial content present online can feed disinformation. On the other hand, we also see actions of platforms that require our attention. Last month, YouTube terminated the German channels of the Russian state broadcaster a move based on persistent disinformation related to the coronavirus pandemic and in breach of YouTube's guidelines. In principle, this is a positive development as enforcing terms of service of a platform against manipulation is one of the key elements to tackle disinformation. But such enforcement requires transparency and efficient redress mechanisms to protect freedom of expression. 
Disinformation is also a business and a very profitable one. Around 200 million euro in ad revenue is reportedly flowing to disinformation sites each year and this estimate is on the lower end. This is why the Commission has decided to act. We have rolled out a unique mixture of legislative and non-legislative tools. First, the obligations created by the Digital Services Act for very large platforms will be a game-changer in the fight against disinformation. For instance, it will ensure that users obtain a choice about the recommender systems that serve them content. Together with the upcoming legislation on transparency of political content, on which I am working on as we speak, it will ensure that citizens are adequately informed about political advertisements displayed to them. The Digital Services Act also creates an obligation for very large platforms to mitigate systemic risks, including disinformation, which include the intentional manipulation of their services with negative effects on public goods like civic discourse and public health. Second, the European Democracy Action Plan offers a coherent approach to challenges to democracy to protect meaningful participation of citizens and sets out targeted actions to preserve open democratic debate. One of them is strengthening the code of practice on disinformation. The Commission is currently facilitating the revision of the code by its current signatories and by additional actors who joined the process. Our expectations are very clear. We want a robust code in the coming months with verifiable commitments fully in line with our guidance. Amongst other things, we have asked the signatories to become more effective at demonetizing disinformation, step up their efforts against manipulative behavior, and to give sufficient access to data to researchers. And we also want to empower the users. Tech companies will provide users with tools so that they can critically assess content they access online. The guidance also lays out the cornerstones for a framework for the monitoring of the code. And the uh, Digital Services Act creates a co-regulatory backstop, ensuring that it fully delivers on its potential. Adherence to the code will be a means to mitigate those systemic risks. As you can see, the European Union is advancing on several fronts, with also in mind the ideas of an industry charter and of a co-regulation layer that your report considers. But, like you note, our ability to ensure coherent actions relies on effective cooperation and information exchange across the board. The Commission and the External Action Service are working to further strengthen cooperation structures, including with our partners. And we are examining how to widen the range of possible interventions, how to expand our toolbox to combat foreign interference, for example. Options such as public attribution of disinformation campaigns are on the table. Designing a framework that tackles disinformation in all its dimensions while preserving fundamental freedoms is not an easy task. Your insight and recommendations of the report towards a sort of European whole of system are timely contributions to these efforts. I am convinced the EU is well placed to find the right balance. So thanks again for Vice President Irvova for uh, taking the time to uh, provide us with this address that really sets an action, excellent scene setter for the uh, rest of the panel. So in terms of the format, how we'll proceed, I'll first start with a conversation with panelists. So asking some questions to draw out on some of the higher level themes of the report. 
Uh, afterwards, there will be a QA. Uh, you can already start submitting questions. I see we already have the first question submitted. So please use the dedicated QA function for that. And uh, then we can aim to have two rounds of questions basically, also kicked off by some external commentators. So, with that, uh, let me turn to our first panelist, uh, Natalie. Uh, Natalie, can you talk us through some of the issues in dealing with this information, also from your government perspective, and some of the benefits and limitations of that, you know, government to government loan proposal? Um, uh, if you could like touch on that, basically, for now. Certainly, thank you, uh, Luke. And um, first of all, uh, let me congratulate you and Alex for the for the report. Um, I read it uh, with uh, great interest. Um, really, I think the challenge with uh, this information is how to respond to it while uh, protecting freedom of speech, um, or how to address the security implications without jeopardizing independent, independent journalism around the world. Um, first, I believe it is important to understand and agree on what we believe this information is. And the EU, NATO, and also the G7 are doing important work on this. But for now, I will share uh, what the Netherlands believes to be the definition of the problem. This information is the deliberate, often covert, dissemination of misleading information with the aim of harming public debate, democratic processes, the open economy, and or national security. It is important to note that this information does not always have to contain only incorrect information. It can be a combination of factual, incorrect or partly incorrect information, but always with the intention to mislead and harm. It's the intent to harm the interest of society that sets it apart from misleading, advertising, misinformation, satire or parody. Now, being aware of all the security implications, we have to perform a careful balancing act in addressing these issues without sacrificing fundamental rights, such as freedom of speech, without censoring media and online platforms, and definitely without creating a so-called ministry of truth. Um, the Netherlands believes it is definitely not up to governments to decide on what is true or what is false. As we know, steps that countries take against this information can have great implications for people to exercise their fundamental freedoms. And I would like to share a quote by Irene Khan, the United Nations Special Rapporteur on the promotion and protection of the right to freedom of opinion and expression. In her latest report on this information, she clearly sets out the applicable international legal framework. She states in this report, there is growing evidence that disinformation tends to thrive where human rights are constrained, where the public information regime is not robust, and where media quality, diversity, and independence is weak. Conversely, where freedom of opinion and expression is protected, civil society, journalists, and others are able to challenge falsehoods and present alternative viewpoints. That makes international human rights a powerful and appropriate framework for addressing this information. That was the quote. Uh, the Netherlands approach aligns with this last point. During our last uh, elections, our line of defense against this information was to provide extra support to civil society and journalists to look at the issue of this information. They are among the ones that should be discussing it, this, and it is a whole of society problem which needs a whole of society solution as the vice president also mentioned um, but should one still refrain from action when for example the integrity of the electoral process is under serious pressure by a disinformation campaign and this is definitely a, a red line uh, a norm that is crossed and as some of you may know we have been negotiating such norms on cyberspace in the un first committee and these processes are lengthy and the established norms are political commitments that reflect a common standard for responsible behavior of states in cyberspace, um, including a norm not to attack electoral processes. Problem here is that unlike 
hacking or cybercrime, this information is too closely connected with the basic functions of a free and open society to criminalize these actions or to find a common position to penalize it by international law. Because this would not only render difficulties in keeping our own societies open, it could also interfere with our legitimate support of human rights projects worldwide. In this light, the governmental norms approach um, is difficult to formulate, as it was also uh, already said in the report, and might throw the baby out with the bathwater. Uh, the Dutch position on this is therefore that since the most effective online disinformation campaigns almost always have a cyber element, like hack and leak uh, campaigns, the current cyber norms are um, sufficient, perhaps not sufficient, but, but they do, um, they are workable to counter these most aggressive state-sponsored disinformation campaigns. Thank you, back to you, Luke. Okay, thank you, ultimately, for like, you know, gave a good overview of some of the major risks for the government to government approach and already how you know, the current cyber discourse is already dealing with some of these issues. Um, now, Liga, um, since this approach, the government approach is often considered very risky, uh, what would be an alternative route, you know, basically by focusing on industry? So basically industry standards or norms, especially for some of the platforms that we see then that we all end on today. So can you talk us maybe about some of the benefits and the limitations of that industry standard approach? Yeah, hi, thank you. I can only agree with what has already been said by Natalie, because a lot of the things that a lot of the things that apply to governments are definitely valid for the industry as well. In developing norms, you know, it's it's possible it's a difficult process by which you get an amount of diverse players with diverse interests, whether it's government or industry, to try to agree on something and formulate kind of the same definition and the same understanding of, of, of where you're going. And I would say when looking from the perspective in the EU, there are very many like-minded organizations in the private sector, um, non-governmental and, and government sector in this space, and we have several avenues which to um, find beneficial solutions but face, face different challenges. So I think that going forward, one thing that we have very beneficial is that, you know, cooperation among stakeholders is possible. How can we use that cooperation? Well, we certainly have the code of practice on disinformation, which is the, probably the most prominent platform in which industry can give input and collaborate. And, you know, it doesn't happen in a vacuum. This is in, in cooperation with the commission, as Commissioner Yurova already said, and the code of practice provides a, you know, robust and flexible system in which to work on disinformation. We recognize that, you know, we, we're industry, but we're not a homogenous group of stakeholders. We all have different products and services that could be affected differently with disinformation. So from our perspective, we certainly look at it through a cybersecurity lens, where different kinds of attacks can, can have election interference uh, measures. We work on that quite actively on, on working on norms on, on protecting electoral systems in different ways. The go to practice is, is uh, I would say, the one area where we can have the most impact on perhaps industry sectors that differ slightly um, maybe not so slightly from, from Microsoft, um, our kind of social media is, is much different and our business model is much different than maybe some of those who are under most scrutiny. But we certainly collaborate in that space to make the best use of the code of practice on disinformation and put forward as much information and, and collaboration and positive measures. That said, um, you know, there's, there's lots of challenges that we're still facing. There's, we're still talking about this topic and it's getting worse. So all of these measures that we take, whether it's under code of practice or working in the multi-stakeholder model to advance norms at the UN level, uh, are, are still creating problems. You know, we have to look for creative solutions. We have different approaches to educating users, such as working in collaboration with NewsGuard, which tries to do, you know, source checking rather than just fact checking to have a more efficient approach to online media. Uh, we try to support, you know, journalistic pluralism 
uh, media pluralism to be able to provide a better platform in which journalists um, can get their voices heard. Um, so it's it's a very difficult space in which to work. I don't think that what I can certainly vouch for is that industry alone or government alone is not going to provide the solution. It always has, there has to be a collaborative effort on this side. So maybe I'll stop there. I think we can go into more details uh, a bit later on, on code of practice or, or different kind of measures that we're taking. But uh, to, to start with, the challenges and the benefits are, are mostly the same that are being faced by governments. At this point. All right. Thanks, Liga, for the industry perspective. So uh, Bart, um, the vice president, already talked about some of the EU developments that we've seen. You know, can you perhaps go into like in a little bit more detail and explaining why these initiatives have been set up and you know looking forward to upcoming regulations digital markets act digital uh, 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 services act and how they are relevant specifically for this information so how they connect with each other basically thank you very much luke and also thank you very much to you and alexander for putting forward such a great report i read it with uh, extreme interest and there's a very very good clear thinking in it so and we can use some of it in the European Parliament because on top of what Vice President Europa said we've also created a, um, uh, a temporary committee on foreign interference and disinformation in the European Parliament and I negotiate some of the measures that we take put forward there on behalf of the Renew group the centrist group there and uh, so we're very into it into it and I think that the um, the Parliament takes a little bit of a more daring stance to be honest than some of the member states do, like uh, Ambassador Yasma just explained, I think very correctly, in international state liability law actually is indeed not offering too much space to operate in this field. But I think that in parliamentarians in general, they, we feel that we are facing death by a thousand cuts, that we are facing a huge storm, an explosion of below the threshold uh, operations from adversaries that actually threaten democracy. And I think that we should also acknowledge that the international law that we are talking about is not offering us the right uh, instruments and the right jurisprudence even um, to counter such threats. It's very much based on traditional thinking before the digital aid, traditional military threats and traditional uh, active measures. And I think that the scale and the scope that what we're looking at now nowadays, uh, I think in Europe is, is, uh, is much more frightening than we did some 20 years ago. So I think that some of the thinking here is also about cyber norms and the cyber diplomacy toolbox. I think that we want to see that far more aggressively being put into practice on every level. In the OSCE, we should be addressing Russian and Chinese diplomats. We should be doing it in Brussels, in the UN. We should be doing it in bilateral sphere, we should be asking member states to do so just as long until the Russians say we need to do something about it. It, it should be not just sanctioning, but it should be, uh, it's either a tweet by Borrell or it's a sanction, but there's nothing in between and that space is still free. I think. Now, to be um, complementing what Jurova said, of course, the DSA is of extreme importance in regulating this information. We're very much on top of it. And transparency and what she said is very, very, very good. What we are trying to add is a couple of things. First, ad libraries. We want to see what um, ads are being served on Twitter, to whom, why, when, and who paid for them. And it should be the same on Facebook. It should be the same on YouTube. So there should be standardized ad libraries, and they should be disclosed to our researchers, like Alexander and Luke, but also some of the academics and law enforcement, so that we can have a broad assessment. Because honestly, we do not know whether Brexit was influenced by the Russians. We do not know whether the Trump election in 2016 was influenced by the Russians and to what extent, because we only know they spent $100,000. We don't know on what street, to what people, to what kind of vulnerable groups, at what time, how. And that is the problem with what we see now it is not transparent enough. It's also not good when we see the commission's proposal on deep fakes. A deep fake can go viral without a what because no watermark requirement is there. We try to amend it. We try to do different stuff um, with the DSA, but let me just touch on two last things, um, Luke, and then give it back to you. Uh, apart from the DMA, the, the DSA uh, discussion on the code of practice, like you mentioned in your, in your great report, I think that it should be democratized. There's a potential to demo democratize this way uh, of governing. The co-regulatory model, like you insisted, uh, 
uh, is, is very much to my adherence. And I think that in Parliament, many have, 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 have expressed their feelings towards this direction to, to, to look, um, to co-regulate it, and, and, and that, that um, a regulator can decide on the penalty, but it should be based on democratic values, which should be upheld by an independent oversight. And then the regulatory can, uh, comes in. And I think that should, could, be, could be a model. It works in the DSA. We could also make it work for disinformation. And, and, and I think that's a great proposal that we could take on board in a report that is coming up now. Um, I'll quit here. Apart from all the things that we need, new and new efforts to look at Chinese disinformation and from other nations, we could talk all day on this, but we're doing our best to address this problem in the European Parliament, make sure that the Commission uh, is, is, is agile and is, 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 is aggressively countering it. And like uh, Europa has said, they are doing their best, but we can do a much better job, I think, and we will be pushing for it. So thank you. Back to you, Luke. Thanks, Bart. That was a like, really good deep dive into some of the EU efforts basically towards this end. Now, Trisha, uh, we've talked about some of the roles of government, the role of the private sector, um, but we haven't really talked about civil society to a large extent. So can you explain us a little bit more, what is the role of civil society of academia in the battle against disinformation and countering? Thanks. Um, and I can also only echo that this is a report that everyone should read. Um, and in my second round, I'll actually have a specific reference to a page number uh, that I think is particularly useful. Um, so, so in leading to this, uh, Luke told me, talk about civil society and the role of, and I said, I, I dare not uh, represent all of civil society. So I am a member of, uh, of civil society. Um, because disinformation, as all of the previous speakers have said, um, is a multifaceted problem, it's a hybrid threat. Um, the solution, therefore, also has to be multifaceted and, and multi stakeholder. Um, and I'd like to highlight a few ways in which we see that disinformation already is being tackled. We've been talking about new initiatives, um, but it's also important to also realize what is already ongoing, uh, that disinformation clearly is dealt with in particular content ways, content specific legislation. If we think of misleading advertising, uh, that being disinformation, um, around elections, there being in in certain member states um, legislation that really guides what you what what you can say. Um, hate speech it clearly is 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 linked to that as well, and an incitement to violence often. Um, foreign interference has been mentioned several several times here, and so there are sets of legislation that deal with either the content or the actor that 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 might be relevant and i think that's really important to think also of disinformation in that more granular way of what type of disinformation are we dealing with and therefore what type of solution um, is 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 necessary um, the report focuses a lot on the small end norms that platforms and, and in particular social media platforms uh, can can play in, in, in kind of solving uh, solving the issue. Um, and there as well, it's something that we have to focus on uh, it, as it being a way to spread disinformation. Um, but at the same time, I think that that's not it. Uh, and it's 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 not sufficient. And I think a lot of the regulatory focus right now, um, a lot of the policy attention is going towards the platforms, and we're we're potentially losing sight of of the bigger picture. Um, and this is where I come to the civil society component. Um, I actually also had a quote of Irene Can <laughs> that I'm gonna, that I'm going to read because it, it kind of introduces my point quite clearly. So in her report, same one, uh, she said, disinformation is not the cause, but the consequence of societal crises and the breakdown of public trust in institutions. Strategies to address disinformation are unlikely to succeed without more attention being paid to these underlying factors. There's many ways we can define disinformation, but it is clear that if we think of citizens, there often is an element of distrust that goes along with it. Uh, distrust in science, in education, in religion, in government, um, in media, and those are things that aren't gonna go away. They're not gonna go away if we ask the platforms to take content down. 
they're not going to go away if we t simply fact check things uh, without providing context. So we really need to be working on the ground in ways that are far broader than disinformation. I think in that way, it's very, very um, similar to dealing with other hybrid threats of actually needing to be dealing with capacity building as well. Um, so we need robust media. We need media that can actually operate, that it doesn't have all of its advertising uh, funneled away, that is you know, get, uh, being provided sufficient um, funds to be able to operate in an independent way from, from, from government. That's an important civil society actor. We need the researchers to have access to data to be able to look at, at the impact and the resistance that there, 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 there might be. Um, and we certainly need the fact checking and the debunking that, that I previously mentioned, but we also see from research that just throwing the right answers at people isn't going to solve things, things either. And a last component is education, of course. Um, and media literacy efforts and working and really seeing in the classroom, for instance, with with young students, um, what is it that they are exposed to? How are they actually dealing with this overload of information? Um, and so it requires all these different building blocks, and some of them are disinformation specific, and some of them are far broader civil society uh, questions and solutions to, to this issue. So I would very much encourage to not just look at it as a platform issue, not just look at it as a security issue, but as you guys uh, highlight in your report, as a whole of system uh, uh, issue, and the system also being uh, the questioning of some of the democratic values that we have. Thanks. All right, thanks, Trisha. Um, now moving on to uh, Alexander. Uh, now, following up what Trisha just said, you know, on the role of civil society, but also the need for everyone to actually work together. You know, why can government or industry actually can go at this thing alone? So, why is there a need for multi stakeholder cooperation on this issue? And perhaps you can already give some examples or work towards some of the suggestions that we made towards the report. Well, first, I'd like to associate, so associate myself with many of the great comments that were just made. Um, I couldn't agree more with what Trish just said about the problem being also a problem of what's happening on the defense rather than how do we actually get the tax to stop. In my book, The Darkening Web, I refer to how different societies have been more successful in resisting the, inf the, inf the impact of prolonged disinformation campaigns or in even information warfare campaigns partially because of their higher trust in public institutions. And I, in particular, draw the example to many Scandinavian uh, countries, in particular Sweden and Finland, um, and their, their experience with dealing with these issues. Um, and many comments have been made about the, about the effects of disinformation campaigns in the US in 2016, how this only could have arisen due to the US's own uh, debate about the validity of their public institutions and and how trust has been weakened a little bit from the inside. And I can't agree with more with that. So that's the first point. Um, but just like um, firefighting is not only about building better fireproof houses, but also is about fighting the fire, plus going after the arsonist, we also have to do some more short-term mitigation. And I was, really, um, I was really inspired also by what Bart just recently said in terms of that we only seem to have two extreme examples with, with which to orientate ourselves which is one is like the, the tweet, which is ideally a, a, a very soft response mechanism or the sanction, which is a very big and blunt mechanism. And also I like to draw attention to what uh, both uh, Liga and, uh, and uh, Natalie said that state can't be the answer for this problem. So I'm from the cybersecurity field and what we've always understood is that um, these types of issues can't be dealt with by a single actor group. They, they never are successfully. Civil society can call attention to a specific issue and they can research it and they can publicize it, but we don't have the access to all the data we need, as Natalie has pointed out. And it's very often only after the fact. So after the fire has broken out, we're able to help a little bit, but we're obviously gonna be limited in what we can do by our resources. And indeed, sometimes our attention will wander. Um, governments only have one tool at their disposal. It's a pretty big hammer. 
but not all problems are nails. And the effect of, of their action sometimes has to be met with the likely consequences as a result. So the big end norms that we've talked about that not really addressed, the ones that we have been discussing, for instance, in the cyber world in the UN First Committee processes, they could be, for instance, a good flanking maneuver. They could effectively cover some, some uh, support, but it's a very risky maneuver for the reasons that Natalie decided, uh, discussed. And it only can be a support. It only can be support to our more immediate resilience efforts. And those resilience efforts can't be led by the foreign ministry or the economic ministry or really any ministry. So then we have, of course, the major platforms themselves. They tend to welcome clear regulation when it's actually in front of them and when there's no way out. But the first instinct is usually to fight against it, to push back against it. And even when they are prompted by legislation or the threat of legislation, like in the case of the Global Internet Forum on Countering Terrorism, which we'll talk about a little bit later as an example, um, good results could arise, but left to their own devices, critique will follow. So for instance, how standards are used, what the transparency is like, uh, these tend to be one-off efforts and need increasing support to continue to evolve and develop. So all actors involved have to effectively support each other. And what we've done in the cyber world for years is we, for instance, use a certain form of public-private cooperation known as the ISAC structure, of internet, uh, the Information Sharing and Analysis Center. Now, basically, it is a, a trust environment where different actors who sometimes would be in competition with each other will, set, uh, will share sensitive and sometimes even classified information in an informal but yet structured way that can also be audited if necessary. So there is a, a way to encourage everyone to share so you don't have people listening in, sharing good information and standing by the information that they've shared. Um, but also in cyber, our experience has been that we understand that it takes an industry to sometimes adapt to this type of co-regulation model and to shift from complete self-regulation, which has been the norm to co-regulation. And we've seen this, for instance, in the United States, uh, in particular, uh, where some industries who were more involved in critical infrastructure protection and were used to self-regulation um, took a long time to actually adapt to this new model of working together with state and federal authorities and developing new models of cooperation in, for instance, the energy ISAC, to give you one example of E-ISAC, electricity ISAC. So it takes sometimes time for industry to embrace this type of model, just like it takes government sometimes some rethinking about stepping back from its initiative to nationalize or control things directly. And civil society at the same time sometimes has to take a, a fairer approach and not necessarily criticizing always powers that be, but try to also understand their needs. So it's a question of learning from, from us all, from learning from each other to make this thing uh, succeed. And we propose, we put forward a, a model for an ISAC in our report where we believe those kinds of concerns can be addressed and where we can draw upon the experience of others. But I'll leave it for the moment. Maybe we can come back to that later on. Yeah. Thanks, Alexander. We'll go into a little bit more detail of the, the disinformation ISAC maybe in the next round. Um, for now, let me get back to, I want to zoom in and some of the, what's the government role again. We've heard a lot of talk about, for example, so the the toolbox, so Natalie, and also what government shouldn't be doing. Um, Natalie, can you maybe talk us a little bit about what government should be doing? And also, I mean, the Netherlands has taken a leading role in the setup of the, um, the cyber toolbox, cyber diplomacy toolbox, as we now know it. Um, uh, so perhaps you can also share some of your insights and experience and how that was effective in deterring some of your uh, you know, threat actors basically in cyberspace. Thanks. Um, yeah, thank you, uh, Luke. Um, yeah, first of all, when you ask what to do uh, governments have to do, uh, let me mention um, at very high level what the Dutch strategy against disinformation uh, entails. Um, it focuses on three lines of action, prevention to prevent disinformation from uh, having an impact and spreading, reinforcing your information position, uh, so to provide timely insight and into potential threats to our open, free and democratic society. And finally, if necessary, reaction. And uh, that's only applicable in the case of serious security threats. Um, in order to build our democracy, we need resilient citizens. And uh, that's also part of our uh, 
uh, government policy, the ministries of the interior and kingdom relations and the ministry of education, culture and science uh, of the Netherlands contribute to this by increasing media literacy in the field of uh, disinformation, uh, both on the audience side, but also on the side of the media. And we should support media workers to gain the training and tools to understand what is happening online and how are inauthentic behavior campaigns organized? How can you discover them? And this is doable by non-state actors. Um, and that is showing for, uh, shown, for example, by um, uh, research publishing uh, organizations like Grafica, Bellingcat, Drog, and Trollrensics. And with the European Democracy Action Plan, we are supporting a pluralistic media landscape or landscapes in and around Europe. Having multiple public perspectives on topics that are discussed in the public sphere will diminish chances that one perspective or narrative will take over and will generally increase trust in the public sphere. But besides strengthening our media landscape and educating our citizens, we should also address the role of social media. Um, within the European Union, the Netherlands continues to advocate for strong information exchange um, and insists on more far-reaching agreements with the internet services regarding misinformation and disinformation. And already previous speakers made uh, very good comments about uh, transparency. The Digital Services Act and the Code of Practice Against Disinformation are steps in the right directions uh, for us. And by making these online services and their algorithms more transparent and by forcing them to take the rights of users seriously and to publicly evaluate and report on them. And we feel that major steps will be taken to change the currently opaque online public places and to change them in a transparent public sphere. In a recent joint statement of the Freedom Online Coalition, the Netherlands and 33 other countries highlighted that the internet uh, should be conducive to a news and media ecosystem where there is access to information and plurality of the media. Free and independent media has a sustainable future and public service media and local news outlets are able to thrive. Public access to factual and diverse information can make societies more resilient to uh, disinformation. And as the Netherlands and the Freedom Online Coalition, we believe that all stakeholders, including governments worldwide, the private sector, civil society, research and educational institutions, the media, should share experiences, expertise and best practices on addressing disinformation. And as Alex also stressed, only through this multi-stakeholder collaboration and engagement, meaningful steps towards countering disinformation can be taken while fully respecting human rights and our fundamental freedoms. Um, Luke, you also asked about the um, cyber toolbox. Um, is there a specific topic you would like me to address? Because I could talk about it for about an hour. <laughs> I don't want to consume all of your time. No, but mostly in how it's, you know, I think it's been in action now. It's been used twice or it's been in action now for a couple of years. How effective has it been really, you know, often has been used basically since, you know, taking into consideration there is now a proposal also for a hybrid toolbox. Yeah. Well, I think first of all that the, um, uh, the toolbox is a very strong, um, a strong uh, instrument because when a block of 27 actually takes joint action, it means something. Um, whether it's being like a tweet, just a tweet, I think it is uh, a tweet um, on behalf of the EU 27 is quite something. Um, or being sanctions being the, the other extreme. Um, of course, we have also, but the, the, like the, the um, reality is that we have been able as EU to speak um, as a bloc. So that is important. And that we show solidarity to one another, even um, when perhaps not all member states have exactly the same, the same information, but we have a procedure now uh, so that we um, 
that we can all rely on a very thorough process in order to come um, to a certain um, conclusion with the toolbox. Um, we're now in the middle of evaluating the toolbox and seeing what else we can do. And as Netherlands, we're in favor of strengthening the toolbox in both directions, both in, in the area of more dialogue, as well as sort of um, the strengthening the, the part of, um, if you will, deterrence or like um, more stronger uh, reactions. Um, what of course is also important to mention here is that the toolbox also provides for quiet diplomacy. And that is of course not always visible to, uh, to everyone. Um, but there's more done than, uh, than just the tweets. Let's put it that way. All right. Thank you, Natalie. Uh, now moving to Bart. Bart, you've uh, also made a proposal basically for you know, following up on the you know, hybrid toolbox basically, and which we should um, uh, deter like, uh, also against disinformation. Now I want to combine that with one of the questions that was already posed, you know, what, uh, one of the participants asked about to what extent we should take into consideration some of the you know, tactical and strategic objectives of our adversaries or of our threat actors. So in short, like how do we hit them where it hurts? Uh, so maybe you can combine those things uh, for the response. Thanks. Yeah, thank you very much, Luke. It's a very good question because the, the way we look at it is it's inaction that actually leads to the reinforcement of the calculus in Beijing and Moscow of low, low risk, low cost, high reward. It's doing nothing. It's not responding actually to these below the threshold operations. And it's not just disinformation. Right? It's also economic coercion. Um, on the hybrid threats like influencing presidential elections or whatever, or even intellectual property theft. It, 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 there's a long list. And, and for all these threats, there's, there's inaction has been too long, I think, our, our response. And that is not good. And it's not good because, one, we do not communicate the norm. And we are doing it right now. And what Natalie Yasma just said is completely right. We are communicating a norm. And a tweet by the EU27 is indeed something because we are saying this is what we want, but if you do not follow up, then you are also communicating it that there de facto is no norm because they get away with it. It's also a form of inaction and I want to see a little bit more. And what I'd like to see in the current state liability law only says if you're an injured state by a wrongful act, then you can do, you can do retortion. So for example, if Lithuania uh, presidential elections were in, interfered by the Russians, that Lithuania could strike back with, a, with, with, a, with an un, with, with a wrong, with an unfriendly act. But the other 27 in the European Union cannot. And that I find weird. That I find not at this time. That I think is somewhat of, a, of, a, of, a, of the, the, the pre-digital decade where this problem of disinformation and all other hybrid threats that have erupted were not addressed in the jurisprudence of that legislation, that law. And that I'd like to work on in the future. We have to set new norms because we should respond collectively to it, not just Lithuania and not just um, but I think the EU 27 or at least a, a large number of, of us should respond collectively and not just EU 27, I think also Japan and Singapore, and Canada, and the US and others should be on board to make sure that we communicate this norm to get be more powerful and also to communicate it with, uh, with, with responses in other domains across asymmetrically that, that you make it more unpredictable on how we as a Western value community will respond to these hybrid threats, among which also disinformation. I think it's very important. One last remark. One last remark. Per permit me this one. We have a 2% norm on NATO. We spend 2%, we try to spend 2% and we work towards that to spend 2% of our GDP on traditional military expenditure. Now, like I've emphasized more often, we have a new range of new threats entering the stage. Is it not time, I ask myself, and you can answer the question with a, with a, with a, like you want, but is it not time to make a new Wales norm of 2%, to make a new norm on new threats? Because that did not just encounter the defense ministries. It also is about, like, like Natalie said, it's about the educational ministries, on media literacy. Are we spending enough to regulate platforms? Do we have the procedures, the people, the processes in place to counter? Are we making our societies across Europe more resilient or not? Is that not 
does that not val value, is it val what is the value of a new 2% norm on the new threads? I think it's very large and I'd also like to bring that into the, uh, the theater. Thank you. Back to you, Luke. Thanks, Mark, and thanks for uh, introducing the norm for 2% again. Um, so with that, I'm gonna just turn the conversation first to Trisha, uh, which I wanna talk a little bit about co-regulation. So you've already written quite extensively about it. So can you maybe explain to us what makes co-regulation co-regulation? Why is it, how is it different from self-regulatory approaches of the statutory regulation as we know it? And um, you know, maybe also comment and give advice on the trajectory as we see it right now within the European context and what advice you would give basically for the European Commission or the problem. Thanks. All right, great. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. So this allows me to give the little headline. Go look at page 60 of the report. <laughs> where there's a great table that kind of gives an outline of how you might tackle specifically the question of the response that we want we would like platforms to have in the disinformation context um, but in particular how you can deal with these issues where you know that you need industry buy-in um, and it tends to range well from self-regulation co-regulation to a, a statu statutory uh, uh, regulation um, and we tend to think of self-regulation in multiple ways where it can be not uh, non-audited, audited, and then, then kind of formal. And um, the code of practice currently kind of fits more in a self-regulatory perspective, but what we're working towards, especially with the co-regulatory backstop of the DSA, is to kind of give that teeth in a way. Um, often we think of why something might be good by looking at what else is not good. <laughs> um, and from reflecting on kind of the self-regulatory perspective of what we have here, it's a good first step. But I think um, all actors kind of recognize that we need to step up the game. Um, and in particular, that it would help to kind of have further guidance uh, in this field. Um, Personally, I've been very closely following the, um, the monitoring reports that have been coming out, both from the Code of Practice and on COVID-19. Um, and just, just from a researcher's perspective of trying to make sense of this, the fact that they're not standardized, that we don't have KPIs to clearly uh, measure on, is, is something that, that that's, it causes a headache. Um, but more importantly, I think, is are we actually tackling the, the problems that are there? Are we dealing with some of these systemic uh, risks that uh, the DSA describes that go across multiple platforms? And I think that's really where the co-regulation can help enforcing that conversation across uh, industry, but also thinking of how can we build in the accountability and the transparency from the perspective, not just that the platforms are needing to make decisions, uh, difficult decisions often now, but also having something for them to, to, to step back on and indicate, look, we have been following the rules and we, uh, we are providing especially um, insight into how we're doing this. I think that can only help that can help everyone. And in particular, um, putting again, that civil society hat and freedom of expression uh, being predominant here, it's really important that you have that ability to, to appeal. You have that ability to, to see also for automated measures, I would say, um, what's actually causing the decision and that it's not just the platform rules, but it's something that actually has been prescribed uh, uh, more clearly. The opposite end of where you can see this goes perhaps too far or where you can think of, of the disadvantages is in a statutory uh, uh, regulation where you have a lot less flexibility. And often you're kind of, by the time you found the solution, you've moved on. Um, and so co-regulation really provides that flexibility while also allowing for uh, some of the accountability and the transparency that we need and also really building in uh, the necessary multi-stakeholder cooperation that, that is necessary. Um, I'll stop there. I've been seeing the Q&A and stuff and I'd love to kind of comment on some of that stuff, but I, I hope that we'll have time to get to some of the questions of the audience and then I can pitch in on some stuff there too. Definitely, thanks Trisha. Um, so 
you've already like explained how to co regulatory format Liga. So if we look at, you know, Alexander already talked a little bit about, about for example, the GFCT and, you know, which followed a, a kind of similar trajectory, starting with voluntary codes and now leading to the establishment of the you know, centralized industry approach in tackling uh, online uh, terrorist content. But we don't really have that within this information. So, you know, is there a net sufficient industry cooperation and what lessons can we actually learn from, you know, other fields in doing content moderation and trying to moderate and harmful for content online? Thanks. Uh, one minor comment I wanted to make uh, before I turn to that question is on Bart's comment on the 2% spending of NATO to be brought a bit wider. I think some of our um, our Eastern neighbors would be quite happy if 2% uh, spending included education and that would justify no further expenses on conventional conventional defense. But that's a different topic for a different day, I think. Uh, bring some of my background to that 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 commentary. But in any case, um, I think the good news is uh, in this space is that whether you're talking about uh, <clears throat> industry cooperation or government cooperation, uh, we've seen that we are more willing to share information overall. And since this conversation goes between cybersecurity and disinformation often, uh, we just have came out with a larger digital defense report that looked a lot about the trends in cyber attacks going on globally. And there is definitely the positive trend that governments are much more willing to come forward when they're victimized, which is definitely addressing the cyberspace in this particular case. But I think this goes towards the trend of how information sharing can go ahead, as, as governments definitely are one of the main victims here. In the past, it's been difficult to discuss things uh, around attribution about taking action against cyber attacks or disinformation uh, attacks against elections and so forth. So I think this one positive step is something that we can focus on and build on. But going forward on the um, different uh, industry platforms and different platforms in which we can talk about disinformation, I think like uh, Trisha mentioned and several others mentioned, this wide range of initiatives is necessary. Preparing for this particular um, panel, I looked at all the different formats and platforms in which Microsoft is a signatory that might touch on this space, and it's many. So uh, Microsoft is a signatory to the following codes and self-regulatory initiatives that touch on disinformation. So there's the EU Internet Forum, the Code of Conduct on Countering Illegal Speech Hate illegal hate speech online, Alliance to Better Protect Minors, Global Internet Forum to Counter Terrorism, the GIFT CT, uh, Charter for Free Open Safe Internet, Technology Coalition, Global Network Initiative. I think we're very good at making initiatives and platforms. Um, we have them in, in various different spaces, but how do we bring these very large scale measures to impact users, which is kind of the, the, the end it's the individual where disinformation grows. So bringing these large scale measures to smaller scale measures is really what we have to find a way forward on to try to combat these problems. You know, we go forward with larger initiatives like that included um, a norm on election security, like the Paris call for trust and security in cyberspace, over 1,200 signatories, but that by itself isn't what makes a difference. It's bringing that message to small audiences, to individual, to, to, to small businesses across Europe, uh, to different um, civil society organizations, and getting them talking about these issues and how they can combat it really at a grassroots level that makes a difference. Um, like I think that Natalie said, that building resilient citizens is what's going to make a difference. So until we can be able to do that, I think all of these large scale platforms are great initiative, but it's what you do after it's the action you take after the the gift CT is in place or several of these other initiatives that really makes a difference. And it takes a lot of work and it's not what Tate makes the headlines. It's 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 good to have new initiatives to gain awareness, but it's this daily grind work of bringing the awareness and changing the users approach to information that makes a difference in the long run and it's that's the most difficult part.
All right, thanks, Liam, for the clarification on some of the industry initiatives, basically, and uh, you know, some of the challenges for cooperation. Again, I think echoing what a lot of the other speakers say, the hammering down on building resiliency. Um, for, now, Alexander, um, we've already touched upon like some of the components from the uh, disinformation ISEC that we propose it. Now, you know, turning away from industry cooperation to a format of basically multi-stakeholder cooperation. Now, you already explained where it comes from. Can you explain to us what it would do, who would be in it, how it would work practically, and what its contributions would potentially be towards this space? Thanks. Thanks. Um, it actually follows kind of well on what Liga was just saying, because uh, uh, when we count up the number of initiatives that exist, it's not that they just all are next to each other, that they kind of add on top of each other, sometimes because previous commitments are being fulfilled or adequately fulfilled. So just to give you an example where the disinfo ISEC kind of came from was not only the understanding of cyber stability practitioners, but also this GIF-CT, which we've talked about a number of times. And, and it needs to be remembered that GIF-CT basically happens because the EU was unhappy that their code of conduct on countering illegal hate speech online, to which, for instance, Microsoft was a signatory to, was not being adequately adhered to. And they made very clear noises in 2017 that there was going to be new rules unless uh, the big platforms did something. And there's a direct connection that also the platforms, to my knowledge, don't deny. And this basically led to uh, Facebook, Microsoft, YouTube, Twitter getting together um, to launch this initiative, which um, was largely quite successful. I mean, just to update people who don't know what it is, it's basically an exchange system where uh, primarily video data has been hashed to create a database that allows um, for basic quick identification or tagging identification and then removal of clearly terrorist content. But of course, the, the question of what is terrorist content um, was only one of the many challenges that it has had, um, even though it's still largely considered a success. So some of those challenges that GIFCT currently has and is probably also working on, um, it's an existing initiative and it's a good initiative, we would hope to take forward in a disinfo ISAC. So this info Isaac basically builds on four notions. Uh, the experience of the similar initiative like GIFCT, which was oriented towards terrorist content. And, and that some of those lessons were, for instance, on the need to develop a common language in threat intelligence. So how do you share that information? It's referenced in the document, for instance, that we might need something called like Styx Taxi, which is a threat intelligence format for disinformation to enable information to be shared amongst providers, but also audited afterwards. So we can check what, what that information was like. So if there are issues, we can go back and, and look how it came about. But we also, we can do remediation in case something wrong happens, which happens obviously fairly often. Second of all, it's the importance of increasing information sharing, not only between the authors, uh, between the big platforms, which also happened with, as a result of just CT. And they already share information according to what we understand, but only a little bit and ad hoc, but it's also to allow that information that they have sh they're sharing amongst each other to be shared to smaller platforms as well. In Europe in particular, a lot of the social media discourse takes place, for instance, in newspaper fora discussion. And we have identified, um, for instance, that some of the, the disinfo campaigns in Europe were specifically targeted on those for those forums, those newspaper discussion platforms, because they tend to be those where the highest the highest stickiness is for some of the debate that reoccurs then in the public sphere. So basically, you get into those fora, you create a churn, you're more likely to get into the news than even if you're on Facebook. So being able to have um, that information that is resourced by the large actors shared with the smaller actors. Um, for free is, in my mind, even a nice way for the larger platforms to kind of take a little bit of responsibility in helping to clean up the ecosystem. It's a nice cost sharing exercise. Thirdly, it's the importance of involving other actors, such as academia, civil society, but also governments, closer to this info labeling and also reviewing past labeling practice. So we don't have that with GIFCT, and that sometimes also detract so much legitimacy. In my opinion, sometimes incorrectly, but and sometimes correctly as well. GIFCT has an advisory board, for instance, that could be, for instance, stronger. But this info ISAC would be built around stronger involvement, both of governments 
for instance, STRATCOM or eStRATCOM and the European External Action Service is a wonderful resource, but also the, ex the existing rapid alert system that has been used by the EU or the G7 rapid response mechanisms. Those are all instruments that government has created that should be useful. At the same time, civil society has a lot to add on this. And sometimes both government and private sector tend to be a little bit worried about what they're going to do. Uh, and I think they have to get over themselves because very often those actors are quite responsible and also understand that when they're part of a larger system, they have to take into consideration their partners a little bit as well. So part of building the trust necessary here, um, uh, part of the building on ISAC is, is really centered about building the trust between these, uh, these, constitute, these constitute actors. Um, the final point is, is that having this type of multi-stakeholder cooperation also allows for the possibility of an Obudsman faction, an Obudsman function to, to be introduced in a better way. An Obudsman in this case would primarily provide an avenue to individual users for recourse and remediation if necessary. And that is something which we see a lot occurring, particularly large social media platforms that individual actors feel they're being uh, unfairly discriminated against and they have no way to get in touch and they have no way to basically complain if um, they get in touch and they don't receive a response. I say attaching an Obudsman function to the center because in all honesty, it's a very big function and theoretically it could also be a standalone function on its own. But in this case, it would be connected to the technical reality of the discussion. So when a platform makes a mistake, for instance, it can address, uh, it can turn to the Obudsman that will be sitting next door and basically say, look, this is the reason why we did about it. This is because we've created this language that you are aware of, and therefore the Obudsman is less likely um, to be critical of something it doesn't understand. So those are the four main reasons that the, we think that this info ISAC would be a, a good tool um, and uh, on its own without having to just simply expand GIF CT, for instance, and why we think also that it would really benefit all actors and not simply the platforms or the government. Um, I want to just leave it there because we have a number of really good discussion uh, questions and I think it would be great if we could get to them. Yeah, thanks Alex. So with that, you know, also looking at the time, basically, I would I suggest we now have uh, one round of uh, questions. So what we have lined up as three folks who want to comment on it. Um, uh, we do our Mahit and Chris Marston and Stuart Mackey. Um, I just want to be able to check the bat, Rick, so we give the floor first to Mahit, then to Chris and Stuart, and a question for the panel. Um, I'll then add some of the questions that were also posed basically from the chat, highlight some of those, and then turn back to the panelists for final comments and anything basically for discussion with the audience. Um, with that, Patrick, can we upgrade uh, um, Mohit so she can pose a question, please? Thanks. Mohit. Is she in there, Mohit? I think she is. She's still muted. So Mahit Landis from the Ministry of Defense. Yes, we have audio. Yeah. Here we are. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> thank you. Hi, Mahit. Hi. How are you doing? How are you doing? Uh, well, thank you very much for an inc uh, incredibly uh, interesting panel uh, that we had, and obviously very interesting uh, report. Um, when we commissioned this research to you, um, it was because we were interested in uh, uh, norm building in the hybrid sphere. And we uh, did a report on that, as you mentioned, last year, and we now uh, specified it towards uh, disinformation. And I must say, uh, you've done a really deep dive uh, into that, and it's, uh, it's become a very uh, interesting report that has that offers real world solutions and very practical recommendations. So thanks for that. Um, also happy that it's that the report finds um, traction in uh, Council uh, Committee uh, of the EU where you're going to present it. You've presented it here in our uh, inter interdepartmental uh, committee. So uh, thank you very much for, for all the work that you've done. Um, I'm very happy also that the uh, the hybrid uh, theme was put on the table uh, by some of the panelists because uh, I would like to uh, to see uh, disinformation at least uh, some um, manifestations of it as part of of hybrid threats, and we should not uh, uh, well lose sight of the fact that we're dealing sometimes with a, a larger problem from uh, certain opponents, and that disinformation is only a part of that, and that we should be uh, careful not to. Uh, uh, well, uh, devise uh, our response to that in, in silos as we as we did in the past. 
My question is really uh, about um, self-regulation going to implementation, uh, because um, commercial interests do not always co uh, coincide well with societal responsibility. What, co what can governments do uh, to encourage industry to implement standards and to make, this inter uh, make industry work with us uh, on this issue? What kind of combination of sticks and carrots uh, can we use uh, to do that? So that, that would be my question for the panel. I hope there's time for that. Again, thanks. thanks. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Mohit, for the question. So next up, we have uh, Chris Marsden from the University of Sussex, who also contributed to the paper. Um, Chris, can you hear us? Please in. You have the floor, Chris. I have to, there we go, I'm actually there. Uh, so, so thank you, Luke. And I, I must say, I, I found the report really fascinating because apart from anything else, I think the problem uh, that, we're, that we're dealing with, the central problem of disinformation has become such a um, widely discussed and therefore less understood topic, um, partly because it has so many different elements to it. And I think partly also because it brings together so many different communities of practice. And so I think it's really, really interesting to see an approach taken that tries to put together, I think probably two worlds that don't talk to each other very well, uh, which is the kind of NATO STRATCOM uh, intelligence defense world together with the industry, civil society, uh, medium and freedom of expression worlds. And, and so I think that's really, really something that's invaluable. Uh, and I hope these, these conversations happen a lot more often. It, it's always, um, from my point of view, I must say, it's always fascinating to talk to people that I wouldn't otherwise normally talk to, uh, at least not since I left around Europe about 14 years ago. Uh, so let me just make two points, which I will try and turn into a question in, in best academic practice. Um, and the first is that um, there's, there's a particular interest, obviously, for, for myself as a, uh, a media and internet lawyer from the UK, uh, which is that we are living through uh, the world's worst James Bond film at the moment. Uh, with the world's most preposterous villain, Boris Johnson, who kind of is posh Trump, you might think. Uh, and of course, we lived through a disinformation um, uh, practice, not just in 2016 with the Brexit referendum, but in 2014 with the Scottish independence referendum prior to that. Uh, and so we have, um, I, people may not have, have seen in, in the Netherlands, I'm not sure. Uh, yesterday, Christopher Steele, uh, former uh, uh, UK Secret Service agent, and of course, the writer of the Trump report uh, prior to the uh, 2016 uh, uh, presidential election, uh, gave a very extensive interview discussing the fact that uh, not just foreign interference, but domestic interference in terms of dark money uh, and dark patterns uh, was being observed by the Secret Service in 2014 uh, around the Scottish election, um, uh, the Scottish referendum. Uh, and then again in 2016, of course, in the UK Brexit referendum, and in the uh, US uh, presidential election, of course, and that was repeated in 2020. Um, and, and I think that one of the, the really interesting elements to me is just how slow Western democracies have been at reacting to the, the threat that's presented here. Uh, I think partly because obviously we have this big, um, and, I, and I very much emphasize that the freedom of expression issue is a huge one to, which is very, very uncomfortable to deal with. Um, particularly, I think, for the foreign policy community which finds it very, very difficult to deal with, with issues where you are dealing not just with multi-stakeholders, but with, with issues about freedom of expression around elections, which I think is, is very difficult to deal with. And, and everyone I think knows the famous quotation from uh, General Heyman, the former head of the National Security Agency, who said, yeah, electoral interference, that's absolutely what the NSA gets involved in all the time, uh, but we never expected to analyze it in our own country. Um, and I know that this is really problematic. So to, to wrap that into a question, I suppose the question is this, do we think that we have remotely the, uh, and, and Liga will know this, and, and so it's not really a question for her necessarily, but for those of us outside the major platforms, do we really think we remotely have enough information about the way in which platforms are operating in content moderation, uh, the way in which scale is being used by artificial intelligence in particular to remove uh, potential threats? Uh, and the ways in which appeal processes work inside those platforms. Obviously, there's the Facebook Oversight Board, which is probably an illustration of how not to do it. But I just wonder if we have enough evidence at the moment. This is not a suggestion that we don't regulate, by the way, or co-regulate. But I just wonder how far we think we are from having all the evidence. And I think that probably applies for 
for Natalie and for other government representatives, just as it does for, for those of us who are, um, uh, we, we're calling ourselves experts. And Luke, you'll forgive my modesty for saying that we're experts in that we're kind of the one-eyed people in the room as opposed to the blind ones. Um, but I think all of us feel like we're operating uh, with, with a lack of evidence. And I just wonder what more evidence we need and if co-regulation, as well as everything else it might do, is really a way of prizing open the, the Pandora's box of actually seeing properly inside these platforms what's going on. All right. Thanks, Chris, for the for the earthful introduction, basically, the comment and also the question to the panel. Um, so finally, moving to Stuart Mackey, um, who is from the European Center of Excellence for Countering Hybrid Threats. Um, just for a quick question from your end before we then turn to the panelists. I just have one more question that I would like to add to that. Stuart, well, thanks very much indeed, Luke. Uh, my name is Stuart Mackey. I'm from the Hybrid Centre of Excellence in Helsinki. And, and really, from, from me and from, from my organisation, congratulations too on, on the report. It's really excellent. Um, I, I really enjoyed the discussion. And, and one thing I particularly liked was this uh, characterization of the options uh, uh, for, to address malign disinformation falling, you know, either being a tweet or being sanctions, and there being sort of a bit of a gap in the middle. And, and we at the center are, are going to be looking at attribution specifically as a tool to try to address disinformation next year. And so I'd really be interested to hear from, from panelists on their view as sort of attribution as a, as a tool in the toolbox to uh, address disinformation. And in particular, in the role of the different stakeholder groups um, that we, we've got on the panel in, and their role in using attribution effectively as a tool to, to try to address disinformation. Uh, thanks very much indeed. Okay, thanks, George. Um, so let me just now, with the seven minutes to go, turn to the panel for a quick response. I just wanted to highlight one more question that we have from Vito Yanfman, which perhaps Bart, you can address, uh, who raised some of the amendments on the DSA proposal with a media exception article in which online platforms are no longer able to content any of the, you know, quote unquote, press publications. Uh, so they can't remove, you know, remote or interfere with any of these things. Um, otherwise, I would like to turn to uh, the panelists. Let me go in the, in the order. Let me start off at Natalie, perhaps, to address any of the three questions. So let me recap. What are the carrots and sticks for the governments to encourage private sector implementation? Uh, do we have enough information to do those kind of things? And then the issue of attribution as part of the toolbox. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Yeah, thank you for these um, great questions. Um, to start with attribution, um, I think um, indeed there's a role for, uh, for other stakeholders uh, as well, uh, and we already see that, uh, that happening in terms of um, um, sort of showing uh, public um, evidence, sorry I'm just putting my screen a little bit differently, otherwise I'm only looking at myself, which is not too uh, convenient. Um, anyway, it's um, so that others um, also attribute. Uh, that having said, I mean, when we use the toolbox, um, it's really up to um, governments to decide whether they have sufficient information to attribute. And every single country goes through its own um, very thorough um, diplomatic response process and in order to determine whether they have sufficient information to actually attribute. Uh, and that's a, a, a national process. Um, so when other stakeholders are keen to contribute, it's really at that um, sort of basic level, I think, where at the, at the national levels where where that is possible. That having said, of course, we also, within the EU, we have um, information sharing. So that could also be an, uh, an option to discuss with uh, the external action services. But then again, it always has to go through the national uh, procedures. Um, on the question that, uh, that Chris raised, do we have enough info on what is going on um, inside these platforms? Um, no, I think we only start to see what's what's going on um, by seeing sort of the, the impact of what's going on um, and then uh, by uh, very active journalists or uh, members of parliament asking questions, 
um, we see um, the uh, what's going on in the US uh, with questions to um, uh, to big tech that we start to see sort of what is what is going on and of course then uh, some of the uh, platforms um, are uh, more keen to share that with governments than others. Um, so we have a lot to learn and I'm really happy that with the uh, Digital Services Act, Digital Markets Act, we take the time to actually listen to all the stakeholders and we, I mean, the EU at large, uh, to listen to all the stakeholders and to study all, all this uh, before making decisions that are um, not workable, let's put it that way. Um, the question of Margrita, I will leave that to others. All right, thank you, Nathalie. Now I saw that Liga, you have to have a hard stop at in three minutes. So, so maybe if you can, you still share any final comments and thoughts. Yeah, just quickly, I wanted to mention on attribution, we've come a long way. And also as a private sector actor, we try to identify uh, those uh, malicious actors who are working in this space. Just yesterday, again, we uh, put out a blog about Nobelium attacks on the global IT security chain. And we continue to do that with a uh, uh, quite a high frequency. And we've also noticed that governments have been able to attribute much faster than they were before, with a estimated uh, length of four months for a government to come out and say we've been attacked by so and so versus 18 months, which was the case before COVID. Um, so in that sense, I think that by us putting out information adds to the situational awareness on which the EU can make its decisions, of course, independently uh, with the national government input. But I think putting that out, the information that we can put out there as, as private sector, I hope is also helpful. Um, as far as uh, just a few more other points and on what we're doing is that on the industry side, I think we have to evaluate and we certainly try to do that from our side to evaluate every way to promote the integrity, trust and safety of our products and services that are online, whether that's in collaboration with governments or with different industry uh, formats, uh, there's there's lots of opportunities to do that. And I think there is a goodwill on all sides, whether everyone is able to answer the questions uh, in the same way, that's a different story, but certainly the will is there. And the last point I wanted to make is that often in these kind of situations, we're sort of preaching to the choir. We're all, you know, very like minded in a sense. We're good willed. Uh, you know, we want to um, solve these problems. How do we involve the actors that aren't so good willed? And that's that's where the key lies, whether it's industry or government, because I think there's a certain taboo to involve different actors in discussions. So how about we involve those actors in these kind of formats? It's very easy to agree with the Dutch and and with uh, the Hague Center for Strategic Studies and these reports. But, you know, maybe we should have some other actors here who aren't so like minded to to create a, more of a dialogue to discuss these issues. Thank you very much for having uh, me participate um, and uh, congratulations on the report. Thanks, Liga. And thanks already um, for your So, Javon, thank you for the contributions. Um, then I want to move on to Bart. Uh, so, Bart, any comments? Maybe also the DSA DSE question, DSE question that was posed. Um, if you could address that as well. Thanks. Yeah, thanks very short. Also see the time. Um, let me just make one comment on attribution first. I think that attribution, uh, especially done by states with active collection by the agencies is something that we could do far more often, far better together. And I think that the discourse in Europe about sharing intelligence is not the right discourse. It is about getting into onto someone else's network and computer to attribute something. And it is very important that we do active collection together. And that step, let's say a European version of the Anglo-Saxon Five Eyes is, is, is essential. And I think that without attribution, Brussels is lame. Without attribution, we cannot um, set in to work our, our diplomatic or cyber diplomacy toolbox or whatever, what, what have you more. Without attribution, there's nothing to work with. So attribution is a starting point of our, of our thinking. It should also be enforced by new cooperation, new forms of cooperation in Europe. And EU does not have a competence there, but we can at least say we need it. And I think the member states, at least four or five, should combine their efforts in active collection. Now, um, one more thing. Um, I'd like to make sure that, that, that we... Um, 
in, in the Q and A's, there's a question on, uh, on on Utrecht University. So thank you very much, Eugene. I would like to stress that we never use ever use the word fake news. It's coined by Steve Bannon. Fake news. It is derived from Lügenpresse, the German word, uh, and it is used to discredit traditional media. And I really like to ask all participants here to get that into the cycle. Do not use this word. Use misinformation, disinformation, foreign interference. Those are more credible words. A last comment on, on the democratization of Magritte. I fully agree with that. I think that the, we have the potential to become truly democratic here, because especially in the code of conduct. Um, it's currently being updated without the scrutiny of civil society. It's just the commission and some signatories working it out. And I'm, of course, curious to the outcome, but I believe that we could make that process more democratic. So also putting people on board from the civil society. And I think many are in this call today. And I, I, I will do my best here in the political realm to get you on board and to make it truly democratic what we do with the oversight on the platforms. Back to you, Luke. Thanks a lot, Bart. So let me move on to Tricia for any final comments. So I would highlight, Bart, that, I mean, some of the signatories are kind of part of civil society now are in that room, but I completely agree with you that we need we need to open that that up. I wanted to highlight um, and also just echo that I agree with you and I'm glad to see that as an MEP that you are not for the media exception article that has been proposed to 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 be added to 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 the DSA. I think that's problematic in it, it precisely for the reason that you point out that RT, Sputnik, other kind of state captured media can easily use to kind of stay away. Um, and for anyone who doesn't have the context, there currently is uh, a, an amendment that has been proposed that would uh, um, exempt media from. Um, having their disinformation um, being be, being taken down by platforms. Um, so I'll just pitch that part in. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Trisha. Now you also saw, like for example, the run up to the previous code. You know that civil society participation in those processes could actually, you know, been a lot more better in the way that they were involved in the boards. But uh, let me then finish with Alexander for the final concluding remarks. The floor is yours. Um, thanks, Luke, and thanks very much for uh, this really rich and engaged discussion. Uh, I think it's just shown how much uh, how much the topic means that we've managed to get this type of response and this type of input. Um, I want to pick up actually with what um, Chris said and then move to the cost element because that works really well together. Um, and Chris mentioned one of the problems that he identified um, is that there's it's not there's not a lot of clarity in the public amongst decision makers of how the large platforms work, how the landscape actually work. And from a military point of view, you could say there's hardly any knowledge of what the terrain looks like that we're fighting on. And this made it even more difficult that we don't even know the natural laws of this terrain. How do the algorithms work that will accelerate, for instance, certain topics and not others? And this is part of the challenge that we're all dealing with. Um, the government, even the Intel side, and sometimes even the private sector themselves, because sometimes they'll tell you they don't actually understand what's really going on with the algos at any particular point. They do know, however, that they're optimized to make the money by obviously churning news that basically generates more time. The question is, what can be done that effectively interrupts that cycle when it's considered to be malicious or malign, and still, however, meet that commercial imperative of making some money? So providing more transparency in how that type of system generally works it is extremely useful for all actors, including even the people who run those platforms. Um, both on the cost side, I want to raise uh, attention to a couple of issues. We have the overt component and we have the covert component. The overt component of cost raising um, is rather wide reaching. And we've I've already talked about everything from, for instance, public attribution ranging up to, for instance, sanctions and the attribution discussion has already um, taken place. I think I would like to add to that. It's very interesting how, for instance, private sector and civil society attribution has basically played into the entire diplomatic cycle, where, for instance, the EU diplomacy uh, uh, toolbox has effectively used private sector attribution as a basis for sanctions without making its own attribution, which was actually harder. So say, actual private sector civil society attribution will continue to be a factor. It might rise. And of course, it only works in as much that attribution is tried and trusted and delivers good results. But the good thing about the system that we work with is that if one actor 
tends to be unreliable or shows to be unreliable, then we move to a different actor. We don't always rely upon the same ones to the same attribution. So at the moment, I can say attribution is certainly part of the overt ways of punishment, but many will say it doesn't go far enough. And this is where we enter the government reign of possibilities. Um, and I would like to differentiate between, um, like to draw to attention to one type of overt response that I don't think is good. And that I think of is overt countermeasures that are kinetic in nature. So I think those types of activities where you have cyber weapons or cyber activities being used to actively disable other operations and done and talked about publicly, that actually draws attention to international humanitarian law. And actually the foundation of international law and the UN Charter is that, you know, words, you know, uh, sticks and stones might break my bones, but words will never hurt me. You're not allowed to declare war because your feelings are hurt. So um, covertly, that might be an option. Covertly in intelligence agencies, you can go off and knock out all the stuff you want. But from my point of view, as somebody who worries about international humanitarian law, international law, I don't wanna see personally psychological operations and kinetic operations being equalized. So that is not something that should happen in international law. It's a completely different situation in covert range. And that's in my opinion also where it should stay. It should stay outside of the realms of gray zone warfare or other misleading terms that frankly are the terminology that Marxist inclined strategists use to talk about how, da how dangerous the internet is. So that's why we have to stay away from it. There's also another overt thing. And that is if um, basically the large platforms persist in not engaging on these issues, stonewalling, and basically giving their bosses bad advice, because I've met some of the bosses of these organizations that are actually kind of open to regulation, but they're consistently advised most often by lawyers lower down the scale, uh, but all the ways they can avoid, avoid additional costs, which actually tends to be minimal. And I think it would be good to also really engage these platforms and show that, that uh, the general notion is to keep their freedom of action, to take this industry led, but as Bart says, state sanctioned approach and we want to adhere to that, but that is a, our preferred option. There are other options as well. And if they're not able to, to deliver, then in, uh, even on a case-by-case -case example, we need to take further measures. I want to just um, conclude with uh, the, the balance and the balance that the platforms always will mention, and that is the cost. The cost to us as a user also needs to be considered. We as a user don't necessarily want to be in a situation where we can constantly have our statements checked or fact checked or effectively even be penalized incorrectly. I have once been penalized on Reddit for a comment that I know was not in any way offensive. And uh, I still got a red war flag warning and I have no way to appeal. And that type of thing I think will be increasingly encountered with users the more they engage in these systems. So I would advise government and, and because the private sector knows this already, I would advise government, but also civil society to be aware of the blowback on the part of users who feel caught up in these systems unfairly. So a light touch is necessary for the whole thing to work. And I think a light touch is also a little bit what we can kind of develop together with this type of discussion. So thanks very much for your time. Thanks very much for your input. It's been extremely useful. Um, over to you, Luke. All right, thank you. Uh, thanks, Alexander. Now we talked about you know, a lot of the uh, issues today. We've already talked about some of the second order normative effects, of the countermeasures about the role of government, industry, and civil society. You know, we're nine minutes over time, so I want to keep this very short and wrap up, and apologies for that. It's been a very rich discussion, you know, for HSS, we're also be looking for it, depending some of the ideas from the, uh, from the, from the reports, you know, things such as, for example, the disinformation, ISAC, and any input from folks here, or colleagues, is very welcome, uh, you know, and reach out to us afterwards, please. Now, I would like to thank, first and foremost, all the speakers for taking the time today to actually join us for a very rich discussion. And also for all the participants, I think you had a lot of you know, interesting questions basically raised already. So uh, in case you want to also dig deeper, I encourage everybody also to you know, look at the report that's uh, available at the website, hss.now. Um, with that, I would uh, wish you all a very good start of the, of the week. And um, I look forward to seeing you all again uh, for that. And uh, I hereby close the event. Thank you very much.